Michelle Kelly, editor of Cottage Life magazine. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Cottage Life podcast. In this episode, our last of season two, we are thrilled to welcome a very special guest, former editor of Cottage Life magazine and all-around cottage authority, Penny Caldwell. Then, we take a look back at an essay from Carrie McGregor about the joys of growing up as a cottage kid. And we wrap up the episode with a pop quiz on some of the most asked cottage questions we hear from readers of our magazine. This is the Cottage Life Podcast, where every day is the weekend. Hey, Cottage Coach Adam Holman here. If you know me, you know I spend a lot of time outdoors. Whether I'm camping with my family or fishing in my top secret spot, there's nowhere I'd rather be than in the wild. But we all have to head home at some point, and I'm pretty sure that the mosquitoes have put a homing device on me. Because sometimes they can be just as annoying in my backyard. So when I'm back in the city, I use the backyard mosquito lamp from off. Whether I'm barbecuing my breakfast or having a backyard dinner with my family, I know I'll be safe from mosquitoes for up to six hours. Which means I may never have to go inside again. Over the course of its 34-year history, Cottage Life magazine has had four editors— The third one, Penny Caldwell, held that position for longer than anyone else, from 2000 to 2015, when she stepped into the role of publisher, which she held until 2018. These days, she's spending more time practicing what she used to preach, hanging out with her family at home and at the cottage. Lucky her. And lucky us, as she still makes time to tell stories in the magazine as a contributing writer. She's joined me today to chat about all things cottage, because if there's anyone who knows about cottage life, it's her. Penny, it is so great to have you on the podcast and to get a chance to catch up. Michelle, I'm delighted to be here. Yay! So I guess some, many people won't know, um, but I should start by saying that you were and are, in fact, my mentor, and I, you know, the first person who hired me out of um, university into a into an editorial role was you, and uh, you know, I've I was so lucky to work, um, you know, on your team for so many years, and I've learned so much. And there's not a day that goes by where I don't say, "What would Penny do?" It often comes into my head. <laughs> so, um, first thing I wanted to ask you is just to tell everyone who maybe doesn't know how you got involved with Cottage Life. Well, I knew the founding editor and art director, uh, Ann Vanderhoof and Steve Manley, uh, through another passion of mine, which is sailing. And so I had worked with the art director uh, on another project. And um, when they worked with Al Zikovitz to found the magazine, uh, they pulled me in to help with uh, various things, starting with writing freelance. So I actually have a story in the original issue of Cottage Life magazine, which I think was in 1988. 1988, that's right. So, um, and then they just kind of, you know, reeled me in bit by bit until I was there (laughs) full time and then they left. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, so that's sort of how it was. And when I started, it was a really small uh, operation. um, and uh, it grew to be the powerhouse it is now with many, many, many fans and, and wonderful readers and viewers and all of the other uh, things that Cottage Life offers. Yeah, so it's interesting you say that because sometimes when I'm talking to people about, you know, people ask me like, how great is it to work at Cottage Life? Of course, it's really great. It's very different, though, than it than it used to be at the beginning. We really were just like a small team, particularly back, you know, in the 90s, which was a little bit before my time at small team and we really did I think it's always been the brand strong suit is that we really lived the cottage life you know what I mean absolutely yeah and one of the things we used to go away together to a cottage every weekend and you know just really 
cottage together. And I think I, I think you'd agree that that's one of the reasons the brand has been so um, successful over the years is that it really does have that authenticity. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Um, we really, you know, live the cottage life. And um, we, I think that cottage life, you know, kind of created community among cottagers. And it started with a cottage community among ourselves. We went to the cottage together. We, you know, made food together. We figured out who was going to be on food teams together. And so some of what we were learning, we shared in cottage life. And then we brought in other cottagers who shared their stories. And so it became like this great big cottage gathering in a way, which kind of turned into the cottage life shows. Yes, of course it did, which now we're into what, are we approaching 40 years now? 40 shows, perhaps, oh perhaps. Gosh. I know, it's incredible. Um, so the another thing I sometimes say about you is that you are the foremost expert on cottaging in Canada. True or false? False. You're the foremost expert now. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd say that. I mean, also, you're very humble, which I, I, should, I should say. But really, I mean, you, you know a lot about the cottage. Uh, I think you can't help but absorb all of this information. When we work at Cottage Life, we seem to, we know about so much, you know, taxes, nature, water quality. Um, you know, we're on the financial side for people buying and selling cottages. We help them with that. We're on the uh, succession side for handing down cottages. Um, we talk about the environmental side. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, everything that has to do with looking after maintaining and enjoying a cottage we were part of and so we kind of um you know we just soaked it up and then passed it on yeah yeah i mean i do think you're the foremost oh. expert because uh i really no i think you know i'd have a hard time stumping you on on a lot of cottage topics which is something we will get to later but before that i also wanted to ask you about something else um in your opinion, what is it that makes cottaging in Canada so special? Like, is there anything else like it in the world or can we sort of claim it as our own? I think there are places in the world that probably have something similar. But um, I think that our multitude of freshwater lakes is uh, one of the great uh, privileges we have in Canada to be able to enjoy those and to enjoy pristine wilderness and um on the coasts you know there are fantastic cottage areas there with you know saltwater beaches and i think that cottaging in canada is so different in different regions and yet we all share the passion um so i think cottaging in canada is is something really special and something we need to to really um look after yeah, I would agree with that. I, I also think it's so interesting how, you know, across the country, it's it's actually quite different, even within Canada, and the culture that exists in Ontario, uh, you know, Ontario Cottage Country, which, you know, is sort of the base of cottage life, although we do, you know, we're certainly relevant to, to people beyond that area, is different than, say, what you would get on the BC coast or even in, in an area that's really growing in leaps and bounds in terms of recreational property, which is the Maritimes. It's completely different. Um, and I find that so interesting. What do you think is the, the, what do you think is the main thread that sort of ties all those things together? I think people are looking uh, to get away from the city. Um, you know, I think that often we're seeking something that is not concrete and um, pressure and the stress of our jobs and all of the other responsibilities that we have in our daily lives. I think that cottaging has been an escape from that right from the beginning when, you know, hunters and anglers used to go up to hunt camps and they loved it so much that they brought their families up and it was really about kind of camping out in the wilderness. And I think that over time, um, the notion of cottaging and what a cottage is has really evolved as well. And, um, you know, when I first started cottaging, um, it was kind of, uh, you know, you just kind of kept the cottage going. And my mother-in-law actually was the matriarch of the cottage when I started. And her mantra was, oh, that's too good for the cottage. Yeah, I love that. I love that. <laughs> but so, so much uh, of that has changed. You know, people are able to go there 
four seasons and so they want it to be more comfortable and cottages are becoming more like home. And so I think, you know, one of the common themes uh, that has run through cottage life um, as long as I've been involved and I'm, I'm sure you're finding the same thing is, you know, how do we maintain that separation? How do we avoid bringing the city to the cottage mm -hmm. as we make our cottages more comfortable and the roads in more accessible and, uh, you know, better grocery stores? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are we just going back to, uh, to our urban selves? Well, it's interesting you bring that up because that, of course, is something that's been flipped on its head again. I mean, that was something we were saying before the pandemic. And now... So many people are spending all of their time at the cottage and, and really using it as their home base because they can work remotely. So that line that you're talking about of bringing your city self to the lake, it's like almost like we're bringing our lake selves to the city now for so many people. It's a really interesting development, I would say, over the course of the pandemic. That's an interesting perspective. Yeah, I hadn't thought of it quite that way, but it's absolutely true. And once people get a taste of working from the cottage, um, it's hard to go back. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's certainly not hard to say goodbye to the 5 p.m. Friday traffic jams and, and whatnot, which I've noticed, actually, the traffic is not as bad on the, on the sort of the, the, sh the weekend shoulders as it's been in past years. And I wonder if that's why. That could be, absolutely. And also people can get away at different times. If they do have to be in the city, they're maybe more flexible about their traveling time. That's right. That's right. Um, so I wondered if we could talk a little bit about your time working at the magazine. So when I became the editor in 2015 and, and you moved on to publisher, I remember saying to you, perhaps, I don't know if you do remember it, but I, I said to you, I'm afraid of running out of ideas <laughs> because at this point I'd been working at the magazine already for about 15 years, which is a long time to talk about one topic. And you assured me, no, no, Michelle, it's not possible. And, and so far, fingers definitely crossed. You're right. We have, you know, new ideas do have a way of coming coming up uh, of course you know there's such an amazing team of editors working on the magazine as well but I wonder you know you were you were the editor for a long time 15 years like how did you keep so engaged perhaps this is a selfish question from from my part but how did you keep so engaged <laughs> in the subject matter for so long and, and keep your passion for it uh that's a good question I think that um you know, I think it's the stories that the cottagers bring to us. Um, it's It may be um, a common theme that, that has come into the magazine, but there's a different approach to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if it maybe isn't quite a, a, a new a new topic, there's a different way of approaching it or it's, it's changed somewhat along the way. Um, so just getting at the stories of cottagers is quite amazing. And also you have to imagine that over 15 years, there are new cottagers coming in and they need to hear the same basic stuff over again. Yeah. Um, you know, so we want to be there for everybody, whether you're a seasoned cottager or whether you're just uh, starting out as a cottager to make sure that there's something for everything and everybody in the magazine. And so one of the fun things I always used to like about about cottage life and I think it was Anne Vanderhoof that kind of set this up is and you have continued it in a brilliant way is cottage life has always had a sense of fun and so if you can address some of the more serious uh, ongoing topics and the you know the deadly stories of how to do this and how to do that and how to maintain your septic system and bring it with a sense of fun then it's just kind of a, a great read, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, there's always new ways to approach that. Yeah, such a good point, um, what you were saying about Anne. It's, it is true that you can sort of talk a little bit about, you know, obviously right now the harsh realities of, of climate change and how, you know, how that has really impacted cottagers and, you know, everyone really, of course. And how, you know, it's easy to engage people in those really important subject matter, that important subject matter, if you're able to engage them the, the pages previous in something in such a funny way, you know, and we have, we're so lucky, you know, Jackie Davis is a person who always comes to my mind, or she, she writes the Q&A column now, and she's just so has a way of, of getting people to, you know, tell her this really crazy information about bugs and septic systems and wells, but in a really funny way. It's, it's brilliant, actually. And I, I, I credit Anne and you for really establishing that foundation in the magazine because I think it's one of the things that you know I love working on the magazine most is that it's funny you know we have fun and I, I think that's so yeah. important 
It is. And, you know, another um, well-known writer to Cottage Life readers is David Zimmer, yes. who is one of the funniest guys. Yes. Around. And of course, he was the editor after Anne before I came on. Right. Yes, you're exactly right. I'm so glad you mentioned him because he, of course, is our columnist in the magazine. And I like to say sometimes that he, he and Jackie fight for the smartest people alive. <laughs> and it's because they just have a way of, of taking this really can be quite challenging and dry subject matter and just making it so entertaining. And I just think that that's mm-hmm. brilliant. I'm, I'm in all of them always. So that's awesome. So tell me, this might be a bit of an on the spot question. So I apologize. But what's a great like of all your years being the editor, tell us about like something that really sort of blew your mind. Like one of your greatest anecdotes that you tell people at a cocktail party when they ask you what it was like to be the editor of the magazine. Oh my gosh. There's so many stories. Um, I do remember, you know, speaking of, of how um, cottagers, uh, you know, cottagers are the ones that send us the interesting stories. Well, they also used to send us interesting mail. Mm -hmm. I remember once getting a letter in the mail that had all of the sort of dust that the termites had uh, eaten out of their cottage. And when I opened the envelope, all of this dust fell on my, uh, on my desk. And (laughs) But even better was the package that I received one day that had bear poop in it. And uh, we kept that in the freezer for quite a while. Uh, like in our only cottage life. Cottage life. life. <laughs> yeah, it was in the lunch fridge. And we had to put a big sign on it. Don't steal this lunch. <laughs> Of course it was. Of course Cottage Life had bear scat in the fridge at the office. Yeah. Don't tell the health department. Yeah. yeah. Is it it's amazing how readers really think we know stuff, right? Like they they really yeah. go to the nth degree to 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 get our opinion on things. That's true. And I can tell you bear scat looks a lot like chocolate chip cookies. Oh. Did not know that, Penny. That's an interesting. <laughs> so you really do have to put a sign on it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting three o'clock snack. Um, so tell me this. What is, and I, and I don't want to, like, again, get you in any trouble here, but what is your favorite cottage area? Oh, well, uh, it doesn't matter if I get in trouble anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You can say whatever um, you want. I would have to say that I have really fallen in love with Georgian Bay, Mm. Um, you know, probably because that's been my cottaging uh, ground um, for a long time uh, since I met my husband and uh, was fortunate to be able to be part of his family cottage. And, um, you know, I just love the wide open spaces and going out to see the sunset at night and uh, watch the sun kind of dip into the bay and it's almost like it sizzles as it goes out. It's so beautiful. Um, But I also, next week I'm going to Nova Scotia and uh, going to a cottage uh, near Shelburne. And that's also a spectacular area with beaches and, you know, from their little beach off their cottage, they can see big freighters coming in down the, down the channel. And, um, you know, I also love, uh, the St. Lawrence River. Yeah, it's so um, different there, I've, huh? Yeah, yeah. I've spent some time on 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 that shoreline, and uh, it's also beautiful. I think the other thing that I love about Georgian Bay is we are we have an island cottage, and so it's uh, a bit of a a journey to get there. I sometimes think about the number of times I transport a a package of food, you know, from the moment I take it off the shelf and to the moment I take it out of the boat and lug it up the hill to the cottage. But, um, you know, that's part of the magic of it is getting in the boat and, and leaving the mainland and then getting to the island. And you sort of, you know, find every excuse to, to want to stay there and not have to go back to, to the mainland. And that's what you're saying about that sort of separation. Like, what a way to separate by just actually going to a different landmass, in a sense. I was at a island cottage just a few weeks ago, and it is more work. It is. We can't deny it. But the rewards are pretty incredible because you do feel like you've really gotten away from it all. Yeah, it's pretty special. And yeah. because we have, um, we're off the grid, so we have solar power now. And we just recently got a fantastic fridge. You'd love it, Michelle. Um, But for a long time, we didn't have any uh, way to freeze anything. Um, 
so the only reason we'd go back to the mainland would be for ice cream cones, which of course are another uh, key another part of the cottage experience. Yes, the cottage ex- <laughs> yeah, exactly. I would agree. Um, okay, so I have to ask you this other question then. If I ask you that one, what's an area that you haven't visited that you would like to go to? Ah, oh, that's a good question. Um, I haven't been up the Sunshine Coast. Love oh, to me do neither. That. Love to do that. Yeah, I haven't uh, been to the Arctic, and I was uh, surprised to learn uh, when I was at Cottage Life uh, that there are cottages in the Arctic. Mm-hmm. Um, I would love to go there. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty much anywhere, you know. I've I've been to some fun places. Um, and met some fun people and it it really is the people that make the Mm -hmm. place as well Mm -hmm. as the landscape yeah i totally agree well maybe maybe this i mean everyone penny caldwell is looking for invites to your fun cottages (laughs) (laughs) she's a lovely guest i can confirm (laughs) yes so speaking of being a lovely guest thank you for being a lovely guest on this podcast today it was really nice to catch up um i'm hoping that you'll stick around because we're going to have some fun with you in our cottage tip section later in the podcast does that sound cool sure i'd love to awesome thank you so much penny my pleasure michelle it's a delight to talk to you Way back in the spring of 1993, writer and then teenager Carrie McGregor wrote an essay for Cottage Life that pondered the importance of tradition for cottage kids. It's amazing how many of her experiences from almost three decades ago are just as valued by cottage kids today, despite so many other changes in the world. Carrie's aptly titled essay, Some Things Never Change, is read by Garvia Bailey. No laughing, no smiling, no having fun. My father says this sarcastically before each trip to the cottage. He says this same line every year, and every year the four of us kids moan and argue just the same. Every year, the family gets into the same fights over who was eating which sandwich, who was drinking out of which can or bottle, and why there is never enough room to lie down in the back seat. Every year, we roll down the windows and sing the same crazy country song, as always, all of us together. And as we round the familiar corners, bumping and nodding over the stony dirt roads, we must all squeal with excitement as our stomachs jump over each hill and round each bend. For this is part of the tradition. My last 16 summers have been spent swimming in the same Camp Lake water and lying under the same Muskoka sun. Where most vacationers crave variety and adventure, we crave ritual. The musty smell when we first enter the cabin never changes. The mice and cobwebs in the outhouse remain the same. Even the clearness of the water is constant, the smell of the pines, the promise of the summer to come. Nothing could be more relaxing than the traditional comfort of a cottage, each year telling us exactly who we are and who we've always been. If it were not for the habitual race down to the lake each visit, even before the outhouse door is unlocked, the countless evenings filled with tea and donuts and card games, the minnows held captive in butterfly nets, and the salamanders and raspberries in old margarine tubs, there would be nothing other than old family photos to link us with our childhood. One of my fondest memories is of an old beat-up truck with an enormous spare tire and maple logs stacked in the bed. The truck had traveled for many years with my grandparents to the old homestead in Saskatchewan and back, but since my grandfather died, had been relegated to wood gathering and small excursions into town. Most of my time riding in the back illegally, we know, was spent screaming Beatles songs played on my big bird radio, which blared over the roaring engine. At the end of the ride, back at the cottage, 
All four of us kids would scramble out from under the mass of leaves and branches we had chanced to snag along the way and race for the swing set, three plastic seats strung up on a two-by-four between spruce trees. From there, we would tear off into the woods in search of wild animals, toads, salamanders, chipmunks. Occasionally, we spotted tracks from the Great Dane next door. We, of course, imagined these to be bear or moose prints, but the real bear sightings would have to wait until one of our sacred trips to the dump. With headlights off and only whispering aloud, these nighttime excursions were the highlight of summer. All eyes were focused on one spot as the mother bear made her entrance. The braver kids would sit up front with the windows half down. The others would shiver next to mom in the back seat. We all waited to see which old refrigerator she would choose to sniff and whose garbage would be emptied, hoping one night it would be ours. You see, a cottage without tradition is no more than a house in the woods. What makes a cottage is seeing the same people year after year, rediscovering old tree forts and hideouts, and most importantly, rediscovering ourselves. This is the reason we go all the way to the little falls at the end of the lake to slide on the rocks and take long walks through the forest just before dark. But the most sacred tradition of all is saying goodbye. I am convinced there is nothing so sad as Labor Day weekend and the end of summer. The minivan is packed with luggage and broken trading post novelties. The fishing boat, canoe, and pedal boat have been hauled up on land. And the refrigerator has been emptied. There are no games left to be played. No jigsaw pieces to search for. No renovations. Nothing. Until next year. Hey, Cottage Coach Adam Holman here. You know, some cottagers are all about the view. Me? I embrace the smells. Whether it's the scent of conifers after a good rain, the Canadian bacon on my cast iron skillet, or... The mist off the lake when I'm out for an early morning paddle. That's why I like to use off, deet-free mosquito repellent during my outings. It isn't greasy or oily like some other repellents. And it's odor-free, so I can enjoy every breath when I'm outdoors. Plus, it works well over my clothes. And because it's safe to use around plastics, I don't have to worry about my gear. So I can focus on the smells of nature without hearing the sounds of mosquitoes when I'm in the woods. For this final episode, we're going to approach our cottage tip a little bit differently, especially since we have Penny here with all of her cottage experience. Penny, I know that before you were editor of Cottage Life, you were the original writer of our Q&A column. So I thought I might go back in time a little bit and see if you can recall some of the common questions that we get to Q&A and we still get today. What do you think? Sure. Up for the Mind challenge? Game. A little bit nervous? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first question. Um, we, get, we have had this many times over the years, and we don't always answer it, but it's certainly one you'll be familiar with, I think. What causes the soap suds and foam that sometimes appears on windy days at the cottage? Does it indicate that something is wrong with the water and is it soap? Oh, gosh, now you're testing my memory. Um, I'm going to guess that it has to do with the phosphorus in the water being, uh, being agitated. And as it agitates, it gets foamy and then blows onto the shore. Um, it does not have to do with uh, soap suds in your water, which is good to know because it often appears after a windy day, not necessarily after you've been bathing in the lake, which of course nobody does. No one right? should do that. Of course, no one does that. No one should be doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I will tell you, you are right, I believe. Oh. Uh, yes. Okay, so you said phosphorus, and because uh, you and I both have such a strong um, affinity to fact-checking, I want to make sure that phosphorus means the same thing as what I'm about to tell you, which is a result of the decomposing organic matter. So algae, oh, okay. plants, leaves, stumps, branches, natural debris, which I think, I mean, if I'm guessing here, any sort of decomposing organic matter has some level of phosphorus in it. So that's um, that's what that is. And, and as it breaks down, it releases fatty acids that are sort of similar to the ones in soap. So that acts as a surfactant and it, and it makes it makes it susceptible to foaming can you tell that i don't know this myself i'm actually reading it <laughs> so, and, no that's yes. great no i think that's that you know we were right michelle <clears throat> you are the most knowledgeable cottager right now no 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 no. because i'm <laughs> reading that like i i i knew that this was not um pollution and because we used to get this at our cottage too growing up on the rito but um it is alarming when you see it it really because it really looks like soap but but yeah it, as you and i can both confirm it is not soap so don't worry soap. about it so i think i'm going to give you that one okay okay <laughs> <laughs> okay okay here's the next one are freshwater clams suitable for human consumption Freshwater clams? Fresh, freshwater clams, that's right. Ah, uh, yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Indeed, correct. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> that is exactly true. We first answered this question actually way back in the 90s. And at the time we said, yeah, you know, you just need to make sure that you know what's in your water if you plan to harvest them. Um, and that's because mussels and clams are actually filter feeders. So they can absorb, you know, any contaminants that are in the lake will probably find their ways to the to the mussels and clams and the, and the filter feeders at the bottom. So you just have to be careful that you know what's in your water. And what's actually kind of funny and a little bit depressing, frankly, is that, you know, when we first answered this question in the 90s, we were, you know, our experts were less um, precise about saying, you know, really, probably you shouldn't do this anymore. And, and a lot of them would tell you that you shouldn't because um, the lakes, you know, they get a lot more use now than they did, mm -hmm. say, 20, 20, 35, 20 or 30 years ago. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Have you ever tried the clams? I never have. Have you? No, no. No, I have not, but I remember seeing them. It's funny. I would like to try them, and I'm kind of interested to know. But anyway, that's, that's our goal for end of summer, Labor Day weekend. Um, okay, here's another one. I, I'm pretty sure you're going to know this answer. It's pretty straightforward. How do you keep waterfowl off of docks and rafts? Oh, um, well... One of the best ways I know to keep it off a shoreline is to make sure you have some shoreline plants that act yes. as a barrier because they don't like to cross that. That's right. Um, so the more grass you have, the more waterfowl you're likely to have there. Um, I remember doing Q&A trying to find a solution to what do you do with waterfowl on rats, on rafts rather, um, and I'm not sure we ever came up with an answer, did we? No, and that's the answer. That's oh. exactly the answer. You don't. You do not keep them off docks and rafts. It's like uh. one of those problems people ask this all the time. And we just yeah. say, sorry. That's, that's one of the things you're going to have to live with if you're going to have a dock or a raft in that, in that uh, location, which is kind of the annoying part of it is because I know this was true for us when we were cottagers that at, at the cottage I grew up at, that sometimes we would have them and sometimes we wouldn't. It was very mm -hmm. much like hit or miss. So uh, it is annoying, but unfortunately, there's no way really to solve that problem, as you learned when you probably called many, many experts to ask, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because any People one of those are... questions, you had to ask a lot of experts. That's true. It's, it's, it's like uh, you have to be like a dog with a bone sometimes. And yeah. the funny thing is when you get experts that disagree, and uh, so you have to try to negotiate between them as to what exactly the truth is. Yeah, no, that's exactly, I mean, that's the hard work for the fact checker, right? Mm -hmm. I, I found when my time doing fact checking, I would call one person, I'd call another, they wouldn't agree, and I'd have to go to the editor. The editor would make me call a third person, and it got very frustrating. <laughs> but at the end of the day, at least it was right. That's anyway, right. okay, yeah. here is the last one. By far, the question that we get the most is about um, neighbors 
And we get all sorts of variants of this question. Uh, You know, why does my neighbor let their dog go on my property? Why does my neighbor um, think it's okay to swim in front of my dog, et cetera, et cetera? Why is my my neighbor noisy? So they'll always say, how do you deal with a neighbor who is doing this thing X to offend me? So that's the question. What do we say to that person? Oh, man, that's a super hard question Um, because... I think that really what we found was the best way was to try and talk to them uh, directly so you don't escalate by calling the police or, you know, getting the pound after their dog. You go and explain the situation and hope that they just haven't noticed how egregious it is to you and will change their ways or modify their behavior some way. Um, That's exactly right. I'm I'm not even going to let you say anymore because you just nailed it. (laughs) Okay. <laughs> what's funny there Yay. is, yes, well done. It's what's funny there is how often people don't even think to do that. Like, just go talk to them. It's it's such an obvious thing, you know. They'll say, "Can I use the law?" Or is there some, you know, association I can contact to help with this? And you know, usually the answer is just like they probably don't even realize, or at least there's a chance of it. So it's the mm-hmm. easiest thing to do. Just go talk to them. So Penny, that is, I'm going to tell you, you got four out of four. Okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> Was there a question that I didn't ask you that you thought I was going to? Uh, no, I think you nailed some of the some of the main ones. Uh, you didn't ask about soaping up in the water, but we sort of covered that, which is such an important one. And, yes. Um, yeah. No. Like, there's a million questions. That's why Q and A has been so popular for so long. You said it, and I will say right now, if anyone listening has a question, like the harder the better. Email us at answers at cottagelife.com and we will get our experts on them. Um, Penny, again, thank you so much for for taking time to chat with me. So wonderful. I love catching up with you and uh, just listening to you talk about The Cottage. Even though you're no longer the editor of the magazine, you still have such a passion for it and you speak so eloquently on it. So thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. That's it for this episode and for this season of the Cottage Life Podcast. Thanks so much for spending this time with us. And thanks to the paid subscribers of Cottage Life who make this podcast possible. If you're not a subscriber, head to cottagelife.com to sign up. And while you're there, check out our free email newsletters, the perfect way to stay in touch between issues. Regardless of how you hear from us, we always love to hear from you. Post a review of this podcast or email us at edit at cottagelife.com. And to find out more about our magazine, our television channel, and our live events, visit cottagelife.com. I also wanted to take this opportunity to extend a huge thanks to the awesome people who worked on season two, including Marie Wayne, Jackie Davis, Meredith Neufeld, Adam Holman, Matt Manouge, Laura Heppes, and Jebediah Roberts. And particular thanks to our editor and sound designer, Amanda Fusco. This podcast is produced by Catherine Jun and me, Michelle Kelly. I'll see you on the dock.